the object, uh, if it's technological, it would maneuver or it would release some mini probes and uh, uh, or it will broadcast uh, some signal or it will have some artificial lights uh, coming off it, not just reflection of sunlight. They weren't supposed to multiply. One emerald visitor cutting through the dark had the world curious. Ten moving in lockstep made it hold its breath. The first frames came from a hill where the air is thin and the stars feel close enough to touch. A sharp green streak, then nine dimmer points that didn't drift or smear, but held geometry like beads on an invisible wire. The usual chorus arrived. Hot pixels, cosmic rays, compression junk, but the pattern refused to die. Fresh dark frames, new filters, different exposure stacks, and the lights still marched together. Cross-checks trickled in from observers under different skies. The minor planet center logs filled with provisional tags and arguments about what to even call these things. That's when the questions shifted from, did we just see that, to how could it happen that fast? Fast is an understatement. A blink takes about 300 milliseconds. A camera flash, around five. The timestamps from the cleanest sequences suggest the newcomers turned on in far less than a millisecond, too quick for rolling shutters, too abrupt for most tracking stacks. No one caught the actual instant. The event sat between frames like a card slipped into a deck while you were looking away. In deep space, speed does that to you. Gamma ray bursts empty their fury in the time it takes to flinch. Magnetized shocks snap across the solar wind like whips. Even black hole mergers can wrap up a thousand years of gravity in a heartbeat. Instruments dislike being ambushed. This felt like an ambush engineered to be invisible to anything slower than a lab laser. But that wasn't the whole story. The fingerprints matched like they'd been stamped. Ten objects, same trajectory to within hairline error, the same phase angles lighting identical tails, and the same clean green glow. In comets, that color often belongs to diatomic carbon lighting up under sunlight, with CO plus and CN sometimes chiming in. Here, the spectra people whispered about showed stronger than usual metal emission features, nickel and cobalt lines that shouldn't be loud unless something about the surface or coma chemistry is odd. Polarization curves hinted that grains were aligning like compass needles, as if fields were combing the dust. Tail widths stayed unnaturally tight across days when physics says they should have fanned wider. Parallax from widely separated observers fixed the formation in hyperbolic motion that didn't match any known solar system family. If it was a fragment train, it was a rare one. If it wasn't, then they were siblings cut to a template, and the math got ugly exactly where you didn't want it to. Thermal behavior is supposed to be boring. If a thing bakes in sunlight, you can fit a blackbody curve, argue about albedo and emissivity, and call it a day. Not here. The mid-infrared estimates, the reflected light curves, and the tail dynamics painted a picture of power to mass you just don't see in rocks and ice. Think gigawatts from bodies no larger than a city block. We build thousand-ton plants to get that kind of output, and they don't have to survive vacuum or micrometeoroids. Add to that the non-gravitational nudges, tiny accelerations that comets show when jets kick, but these nudges came with a subtle 11 hertz flicker hiding in the light curves. Spin? Maybe. Thrusters cycling? If you're wearing a hard hat, you start shifting your weight. Simulations didn't help. Tweak the temperature, pressure, volatile mix, and jet geometry, and the models still blew up or converged on power densities the textbooks don't permit. When the numbers won't sit quietly, either your assumptions are broken or the universe is breaking them for you. And that's where the room split. One camp called it engineered. The logic felt ruthless. A larger body enters first, then sheds denser, hotter companions that can dive closer to targets without risking the main craft. Formation flying checks a box. Matched spectra checks a box. Abrupt appearance checks a box. Years ago, a thought paper floated the dandelion seed idea, dropped probes that ride sunlight and gravity into a system. This looked suspiciously like a field test. Across the aisle, the naturalists fought back with physics that doesn't require intent. Hyper-strong bodies exist, Think compressed ices, sintered dust, even exotic crusts, all of which could survive a savage impact long enough to splinter into weighted shards. The fragments would keep the parents' path and speed, riding a breadcrumb trail through sunlight. Weird chemistry could light green and give you sharp tails, but rubble doesn't hum like a reactor for days, and rubble doesn't flash a clean periodic flicker unless something is steering it. The debate might have stalled there if the rumors hadn't shown up. 
Ham operators and sky surveys started talking. A narrowband flutter around 1420 megahertz, the hydrogen line, peaking up, repeating every 43 seconds for about 11 minutes, then dying. Coincidence? Instrument ghosts? Maybe. But the Deep Space Network logged a small, sudden change in system noise temperature near the same window. Timing Labs saw a nanosecond ripple cut across GPS-disciplined clocks. IceCube flagged a weak neutrino multiplet within the orbit-fit time span, while Chime checked fast radio burst databases and came up cold. None of it was peer-reviewed. Some of it will die in calibration corrections. If even one signal survives, the story tilts. If all of it evaporates, the burden slides back to sunlight and outgassing. And then the sky added a second twist that no one needed. From the opposite direction, a bigger, brasher visitor woke up. People started calling it Swan R2, brighter coma, hotter jets, a tail measured in degrees of sky. Orbit solvers placed its perihelion within days of the first objects, setting up what one observer called a traffic jam with a hard sun in the middle. The cadence hunters rolled out their scrolls. Every approximately 2,200 years, they said, the record mutters about a green banner and a star that splits. Chinese court astronomers wrote of a dragon with a torn tail. Babylonian tablets engraved a herald of upheaval. Medieval European notes sketched a green torch with a ragged hem. If there's a cycle, we're on the beat. Is Swan a shield, sweeping in to intercept? A siphon, timing a visit to feed at perihelion? Or just a big loud coincidence blessed by our attention? Even the skeptics admitted the timing was inconsiderate. And while the public statements stayed cool, the backrooms did not. Calm language floated out. Ongoing observations. No evidence of direct threat. Verification in process. Inside, gears meshed. Old planetary defense plans came off the shelf. Hera's blueprints got a second look. Dart's lessons were pulled into quick and dirty intercept notes. Neo surveyor briefs were repurposed to ask what mid-IR could see if someone fast-tracked calibration. Hubble's solar avoidance limits were pushed against. JWST's sunshade geometry made it mostly a spectator this close to the sun. Soho and Stereo were suddenly the cool kids again. Parker Solar Probe and Bepi Colombo adjusted campaign priorities. Private launch providers were asked how quickly they'd stand up rapid sequence flights for reconnaissance. Small instruments, high delta V, no frills. Starship and New Glenn were whispered as platforms for piggyback scouts. UNUSA and the IADC compared notes. A FOIA wave hit for raw spectra, and the replies came back with the familiar verification first boilerplate. Silence reads like prudence to some and like strategy to others. Either way, the window tightened. Perihelion squeezes time until it squeals. Speeds climb, errors grow teeth. If the nine companions held tight formation through the burn around the sun, that would scream control. One brain, many hands. If they fanned out, it would write a different story. Probing runs, gravity steals, target sniffing. Early in the approach, tiny non-gravitational terms crept into the orbit fits. A one and a two drifted beyond what dusty jets alone wanted to explain. One companion slid closer to the ecliptic by a whisper. Another brightened against phase angle in a way that did not track standard dust physics. Polarimetric swings hinted at field-aligned particles. Tail eddies suggested magnetized structures in the solar wind were shaping the flow like fingers through smoke. That's a lab trick. Seeing it in the wild raises eyebrows. Then, Swan R2 flared like a magnesium strip. The flare wasn't just pretty. Radio hiss rose. Photometry spiked. Some analysts mapped a faint shock where the solar wind rammed the newcomer's cloud. A few argued they saw the heliospheric current sheet kink and rebound. If the two visitors' wakes overlapped, their tails could braid, deflect, or punch holes in each other. That's not cosmetic, that's physics with attitude. If the smaller companions timed passes through Swan's wake, they could sample material or hide in radio noise. Too neat? Maybe. But geometry put the option on the table. And while we argued about choreography, more practical questions piled up. What can we measure fast? Who can launch first? And how loud should we be while we do it? Assume for a moment the engineered camp has the read. Then the mission isn't a visit, it's a survey. Map magnetospheres, taste atmospheres, measure our radio habits, test how we posture. If you're going to knock, 
you listen first. Advocates of a firm stance argued for a coordinated alert among nuclear states, not to use anything, but to signal spine, and for synchronized broadcasts that say plainly, we see you. Others said the opposite. Don't escalate a misunderstanding. Curiosity isn't invasion. Patience is also posture. Now assume the natural camp is right. We're still not off the hook. Interstellar fragment trains can be dangerous in their own boring way, and measurement artifacts can masquerade as miracles. But 20 gigawatt rumors don't repeat across 10 bodies by getting lucky with the same calibration error. The only cure for guesswork is data, and the clock doesn't care what we think. By the time dawn crept up, the sky had an audience. Backyard scopes, school domes, national observatories, everyone looking at the same green threads. Databases swelled, light curves sharpened. The formation mostly held. Then, in the noise, small oddities kept peeking through, an 11 hertz flicker that didn't quite track spin, a polarization swing that didn't line up with dust models, a whisper near 1,420 megahertz that refused to stay long enough to pin. The conservative read, dusty physics and geometry playing tricks. The aggressive read, systems testing in the clear. That's when the big body, the one that started the story, pulsed brighter than forecast, as if answering a question nobody had finished asking. And the feeling that we were watching a conversation, not a coincidence, got harder to ignore. So where does that leave us? 10 travelers that move like a choir, a louder stranger arriving on a schedule some say we should have seen coming. Power signatures that sneer at our comfort. Agencies speaking softly. Leaks saying the quiet parts. Intercept concepts sketched on whiteboards. Solid kick stages. Solar sails for fast rendezvous. Piggyback scouts on whatever rides soonest. Racing a calendar that won't slow down. If nature is flexing a mode we've never modeled, textbooks will need new chapters. If someone else is operating, we're already in the conversation whether we RSVP or not. The universe just knocked. Hard. Do we crack the door and ask who's there? Dim the lights and pretend no one's home? Or step onto the porch and see what wants to be seen? Tell me your read below. Fragment train with wild chemistry? A deliberate drop-off we caught by luck. Two wanderers converging for reasons that don't include us at all. Hit subscribe so you don't miss the next wave of data. We'll be here when the numbers settle, and when they don't.